morning. <clears throat> Scripture reading today in God's Word is the whole book of Deuter Deuteronomy. <laughs> Nearly. Praise God anyway. I am making this covenant both with you who stand here today in the presence of the Lord our God and also with the future generation who are not standing here today. I am making this covenant with you so that no one among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe, will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations, and so that no root among you bear bitter and poisonous fruit. The Lord will never pardon such people. Instead, his anger and jealousy will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will come down on them, and the Lord will erase their name from under the heavens. And all the surrounding nations will ask, What has the Lord done? Why has the Lord done this to this land? Why was he so angry? And the answer will be, This happened because the people of the land abandoned the covenant that the Lord the God of their ancestors made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. That is why the Lord's anger has burned against this land, bringing down on it every curse recorded in this book. The Lord our God has secrets known <coughs> to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of this instruction. So be it. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you have written your word down for us, that you have revealed yourself to us, that Jesus Christ gave up heaven that he became flesh and dwelt among us. Father, may we hear your word today and apply them to our lives. May you give us understanding through your spirit. May you fill us with the gifts of your spirit so that we can be the part of the body of Christ that we're called to be and draw others towards salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you that we have the freedom to come here and study your word today. We just thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do, and we look forward to that glorious day when Jesus Christ returns. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I took us back to Deuteronomy to show us the pattern here that we continue to see and how God has given us a standard and we always fall short. So we can tie that video back together and see that we need a Savior. No man's going to do it for us except the God-man, Jesus Christ. He did it. It's done. It's completed. And now it's your decision to decide whether you will follow after Him or you won't. Wednesday we started Awanas. You heard that earlier. We had a very good turnout. 39 children. Wow. That's how we started it out. And what a privilege and honor to train those children up. Sometimes we feel like we're not equipped. Sometimes we feel like, why are we here? But when you yield to the Holy Spirit and you do what He tells you to do, He equips you for every good work. Those children get to hear about Jesus Christ. We took a trek check when we started ours, and we had some kids move up, so the trek class grew for me. Um, I don't know what the numbers were in the others, but we had a lot of cubbies. <laughs> um, pray for it. If you can serve, serve. But I wanted to start out with how this trek check started. Because sometimes we need to be reminded that we're on a trek. We're on a journey. This life is not our home. We have one life to live. We're created beings. And we live to bring God glory and honor. And He will use us, as we've seen all throughout our reading of the Scriptures, one way or the other. He is in sovereign control. To know that, that he had the descendants of David still lined up. And a guy's name that's a priest, his name is Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus. 
lined up for this same job and those men couldn't complete it, but there is a promise that one man would come and complete it, Jesus Christ. And it, it's told in Scripture that he would be rejected by his own people. It's, it's all there. You've just got to decide if you're going to believe it, and then if you do believe it, if you're going to live it. So we're on a trek. One day there will be a glorious day, but for some people there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This trek story started out, and we had all the kids fill it out, and they're like, you fill one out, Alan, you fill one out. Okay because they want to see if I can fill it out even funnier and everything, right? So I, I tried. You may get some of these references, you may not. But it says, to get you thinking about going on a trek, a trip, fill in the blank story. You and your, and you have to fill something in here. So I put bunny. <laughs> Are going to Tatooine. That's a place in Star Wars if you don't know, okay? In a rubber ducky. You get hungry, so you pull off at the next exit to eat at Hungry Hippos. You order a Slurpee and double stuffed Oreos. When the waitress brings the food to you, she hands you a folded piece of paper. When you look inside, you discover a treasure map. Do you realize that that's what this life is all about? We're going through parables in, in uh, Sunday school class, but the treasure that we have and one of the parables talks about, you know, that treasure in the field. Maybe that was Jesus giving up everything for the treasure that he found in us. And reading that again and coming at it with those eyes is just so refreshing. And every time that I have read through these passages again, whether they've been super familiar or if they've been foreign to me, God gave me these nuggets and told me, you know, this is what I want you to find out of this. And that's why I want you guys to, to hunger and thirst and read God's Word. So today I want to t t tie together as best I can in the time period that I can. Um, Haggai, Haggai, and Daniel. I know you understood everything you read in Daniel. Yep, you got it all figured out, right? <laughs> See, that's why I'm doing this in Zechariah a little bit. Daniel even said in Daniel, he said, I don't know what this means. And you can read and study and you go into the commentaries and stuff and this one guy says this is what it means. And this guy says this is what it means. I don't know. You don't know. But as you read God's word, he will reveal to you what he wants to tell you. Especially when you come at him with a loving heart that says, teach me, Father. So at the end of Haggai in a little sheet, it gave a challenge. The challenge was our choices matter. The obedience of God's people is part of how God works in the world, and this should mo motivate humility and action. That's our challenge that was given from Haggai. Zechariah, if you notice in the top corner of the little diagram, and that's why I all gave you one, this is a wild ride, and we're going to talk about that. But first I wanted to tell you, I asked you last week, do you think Nebuchadnezzar got saved? If you kept reading... It took God taking him down to a beast, to a wild animal, taking out from him the image of God that we are all created in, removing that to get him to come to the knowledge that he wouldn't just give God lip service anymore. He would acknowledge him and mean it. Now that's the last we hear of Nebuchadnezzar. So we don't know. But it, in chapter 4 you, you see a king that has finally humbled himself and says, you know, there's a God that's much greater than I am. And maybe that God's will matters more than my own. I don't know if he'll be in heaven or not, but I'm looking forward to meeting him if he is. Not because of the righteous things he did, because <laughs> he did not. But neither did any of us. But because God's grace is so big that it can save Nebuchadnezzar. It's so big that it can save me. It's so big that it can save you. In Daniel chapter 4, we read this. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. As you're reading through, you'll notice that that's a pattern. Shalom, that's how the Jews greet one another still today. They're looking for that peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that you can only find through Jesus Christ. Zechariah starts out with a vision talking about peace. But see, there wasn't peace in the world without God. It's a false peace. You might find your peace in your health or your riches 
or your intelligence or whatever it is. But take those things away from you and see if you have peace without knowing Jesus Christ. Because He can walk you through the valley of the shadow of death where you will fear no evil. If you put your faith in anything else, you're going to find a rude awakening just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Verse 2 says, I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are His signs, how powerful His wonders. His kingdom will last forever, His rule throughout all generations. Certainly sounds like worship to me that he's describing there. In verse 4, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace. So there's a dividing point here. We don't know how far it is. So as you're reading that, realize that. I was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, or at least the king thought, right? He said, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. So I guess he hadn't come to worship yet after all. It looked like he had before, but God is still going to lower him more to say, wait a minute, you're telling me you worship me, but you're not showing me that your worship is genuine. You're giving me praise with your mouth, but I examine your heart and I know your heart is still far from me. So one night Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that frightened him. I saw visions that terrified me as I laid in my bed. Then drop down to verse 34. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. This is, this is after he grazed like an animal for seven years. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom eternal. Sounds like the same words. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Well, now there's a little phrase that, that stuck out to me that said, now I think he's getting it. Because <laughs> now he's saying, you know, I don't understand your ways, anything else, but you've knocked me to the ground and you've lifted me up again. I appreciate all the things that you did give me before the riches that you gave me, the power that you gave me. I give glory and honor to you. I can't explain these things, but you, God, are God. Think of what Job said, okay? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify, the, glorify and honor the King of heaven. His acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. A direct phrase that Nebuchadnezzar is saying about himself. Because until you realize you're not on the throne, it's hard to accept that God is on his throne. You want things to happen your way. The very reason that Jesus was rejected as the Messiah, even though clearly prophecy told about him, people still rejected him because that's not the king that I want. I want the king to come set up that rule right now where I can reign and have the prosperity now. I don't want to suffer through things to, to get to that point. But wait a minute. Didn't my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ suffer for me? Didn't he give up heaven? Did he not have a home to, to not lay his head on? And did he not give up his life so that he could restore me? Second Chronicles 7, 14, you know that verse well, says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's how it starts. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. Micah 6, 6 through 9 tells us how we should live. Not by just coming to church, not by reading our Bible, but by living a lifestyle that Jesus Christ lives. Verse 6 says, What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring Him burnt offerings? Should we bow before the Most High with offerings of yearly calves? Should we offer Him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. O oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good and what He requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Fear the Lord if you are wise. His voice calls to everyone in Jerusalem. The armies of destruction are coming. The Lord is sending them. 
one day there will be grace upon grace upon grace like you've never seen on that glorious day. But on that day also will be the judgment and the wrath of God for the rejection of His Son. Where will you stand on that day? It's your choice. It's not someone else's choice. It's your life that you live. <clears throat> Next week I told you we'll start reading the New Testament. It's a good time to pick up if you haven't been faithful. We're going to go through it fast. October, November, December, and we're going to go through the New Testament. Wow, that's fast. But yet we sit there and look at it saying, boy, it's going to take too long to read God's Word. What do you want? What do you desire? Do you hunger and thirst for God's Word? James was one of the first letters written to the churches. And here's what James says to those who claimed to be godly, to claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. James 4, verse 4. You adulterers. Haven't we heard that pattern over and over again through the Old Testament? And here it is in the New Testament just the same. It's not any different for the church. You've got people that profess that they love God, but their actions and hearts are far from Him. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be friends of the world, you make yourself an enemy with God. Do you think the Scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the Spirit He has placed within us should be faithful to Him, and He gives grace generously. As the Scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See all these things tying together? So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. You're an adulterer. You're a harlot. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. Does that not just sound like what we read of Nebuchadnezzar? Does it not sound like the video that we saw of Jeremiah, the one we saw of Haggai? God calls His people to love Him as He loves them. He will be faithful. You don't have to worry about that even when you're unfaithful. But when you realize, when the Spirit talks to you and says, Hey, your love's been a little bit cold. As the letters in, G in Revelation said, Come back to me. Because Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. So now we're to Zechariah. We got six, eight visions, right? And you understood those, correct? Video helped a little bit, I hope. Okay, you should have read through chapter 7 in Zechariah yesterday. You'll read chapter 8, and then you'll notice that division in chapter 9. And as you read it, especially if you read through the, through the lens of Christ, you'll say, how can this not be talking about Jesus Christ? Told many years before with such accuracy. And how Jesus knew these things would happen to him. He knew Scripture. He was the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. And yet he still gave up heaven and came to earth to die for us, knowing he was going to be rejected and scorned. No wonder in the garden he cried and had such tribulation upon him that he sweated drops of blood. But yet he was faithful to the end because he loved us. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Zechariah chapter 1, and I'm going to try to go through this without spending all day. But I want to go through those eight visions and kind of tie them together. And ironically, Steve asked me a question about one last week that we'll get to, and I, I hope I can answer that. I am going to read from the New Living Translation because it's what I'm reading through. And in Zechariah chapter 1, the, the header says, A call to return to the Lord. Something we've seen constantly. And it introduces who Zechariah is and gives us a date in history so we know that. Verse 2 says, I, the Lord, was very angry with your ancestors. That's why I had Merle read from Deuteronomy to know what was expected of us. And to know that God, even when He did all that, knew that we would be unfaithful again. Okay? <clears throat> Therefore, says 
Therefore say to the people, Zechariah, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says, Return to me, and I will return to you. Same words that we just read in James. Salvation is a relationship. It's described as a husband to a wife. It is something that is supposed to be honored and something that the person should be jealous for the love of the other person. And God, Scripture tells us that God is jealous for us. Okay? Verse 4, Don't be like your ancestors who would not listen or pay attention when the earlier prophets said to them, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Turn from your evil ways. This same pattern over and over. And stop all your evil practices. Where are your ancestors now? They're long dead. Verse 6, But everything I said through my servants, the prophets, happened to your ancestors just as I said. History where history does speak tells exactly what the Bible says. Many times history doesn't agree with the Bible because history simply hasn't found it out yet. We haven't found that writing or we haven't dug that archaeological spot. So they'll say this didn't happen or this happened and then we find this discovery and said, oh, yes, yeah, just like the Bible said already, isn't it? Even science, even medicine, we don't find the Bible now thousands of years later to contain er errors. Everything I said would happen, happened just as I said. As a result, in verse 6, they repented, the people now that Zechariah is talking to. Or as the video says, and that's why you have the pictures there, it says, or at least uh, that they act like they did, right? That's in the verses 1 to 6, and on the bottom it says, we repent, or at least it seems like they did. You've got that lip service again, but where is your heart? And they said, We have received what we deserve from the Lord of heaven's armies. We have done what he said he would do. Now as you read through the New Testament, you're going to see a pattern over and over again because Jesus Christ did, but you're going to see that he called for his followers to do it, and you're going to see that the church did it. Suffer. You think they would go on and say this if their heart was genuinely true, if they started suffering again? Or would they say, Wait, why are you doing this? Well, spoiler alert. Go to Malachi, and you're going to get them to say, wait a minute, it's not us, it's you're the one that's unfaithful. That's what they even say to God, okay? Because we don't like to suffer. We want to put the coin in the vending machine, God, and get out what we pick. That's how we want it to be, because we are sinful people. But when God gives a new heart through His Spirit, then we can view things differently and see the grace upon grace upon grace that God has given us. So they say they have repented. As a result, in a later time, three months later, verse 7, we see a man among the myrtle trees, is what the NLT says. This is vision 1. Okay, And you can see that in the number 1 on your um, thing. Now remember on your chart that it goes like this is how it goes. He's lined it up to show the similarities, but this is the pattern of the eight um, visions. Okay? The Lord sent another message to the prophet. And this is in February, which is the time of the first fruits of the harvest, is when he sends this message. A time that's been a few months after uh, Zechariah has told them to repent. Maybe he's seen some signs of repentance. Maybe he hasn't. But these visions come along to emphasize, kind of like Jesus with the parables, let me tell you these visions so that you can tell them to the people. Verse 8, In a vision during the night I saw a man sitting on a red horse that was standing among some myrtle trees in a small valley. Behind him were riders on red, brown, and white horses. I asked the angel who was talking with me, My Lord, what do these horses mean? I will show you, the angels replied. So it should be clear as mud to us, right? Because it says it's going to be revealed here. Well, the very first thing when I'm reading this, I'm like, is the angel on the horse and the angel talking, is that the same angel? Because it's not clear, especially when you get pronouns and stuff. So don't worry. Just read God's Word and ask Him what He wants to be revealed to you. You don't have to have all the answers. I'm going to remind you again, Daniel said, I don't understand these things is what he said at the end of the book. Okay? Verse 10, the rider standing among the myrtle trees explained, these are the ones the Lord has sent out to patrol the earth. Now, your version might say to and fro. Patrol is a word that the NLT uses, and there's no real reason for them to use that from a word basis. But as you read the Scripture, you can see that 
that's kind of what their purpose is, so they've put that word in there. Okay? Verse 11, Then the other writers reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, We have been in the same thing. The word might be to and fro or whatever it is in yours. But they're, why did they go to and fro? They've gone to and fro, and patrol is a pretty good word, to see what the world is doing to report back to God, to do things also. We don't know what all these things are, and you'll see as we go in the vision a little more by the description of the horses that we can imply some things. But you don't have to figure all this out. Okay? Verse 12, Upon hearing this, the angel of the Lord, now we've picked up a little uh, authority level here and who just the angel is. Even maybe it's, it's a representation of Jesus Christ. He prayed this prayer, O Lord of heaven's armies. Ah, now we get that, and the words used here are that, that we're talking about God Almighty. That might be what yours says. We're not just talking about God, but God who will bring His justice as much as He brings His love and mercy. For 70 years now you've been angry with Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. How long until you again show mercy? Verse 13, And the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with him. Then the angel said to me, Shout this message for all to hear. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. My love for Jerusalem and Mount Zion is passionate and strong. The word is jealous there again. Jealous as I described to you of a husband and a wife. I am jealous for my lover. I don't want anybody else touching her, anybody else bringing peace upon her. Because remember they come back and say the world's at peace. No, they're not. You think you're at peace because the things that make you happy at this point. But real peace comes from knowing God and knowing that that day when it comes, it will be a glorious day for you. Okay? But, uh-oh, that's how the verse 15 starts. I am very angry with the other nations that are enjoying peace and security now. Well, wait a minute. God helped bring this peace and security along. Ezekiel showed us that the presence of God was in Babylon just the same, but now he's upset. He's upset because we haven't repented and turned from our ways. His purpose even there was to bring himself and make himself known to a foreign land. Even in, in Israel's rebellion and exile, God was showing his wonders to the rest of the world because it's his will that all men become saved. Okay? I was only a little angry with my people, but the nations inflicted har harm on them far beyond my intentions. Now, here's a problem with words. Don't take that as in God didn't know what he was doing or anything else. It means that mankind does things that he never intended for them to do because we were created in his image and everything. Verse 16, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I have returned to show mercy to Jerusalem. My temple will be rebuilt, and measurements will be taken. Verse 17, say this also, this is what the Lord of heaven ar army says, the towns of Israel will again flow with, overflow with prosperity and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem for his own. That's the first vision. But you've got to ask yourself, when will this be? Especially if you're the people who were in exile at that time, take this back to that time and put yourself there. When will this happen? Haven't? I got enough wrath from you already? No, <laughs> not at all. You got, the people already said it, we got what we deserved. But I want an end to it. The end will come on that glorious day. No one ever said, in fact, Jesus said, you will have trouble in this world. Don't you think that if they persecuted your master and Lord that they won't persecute you? But it will be worth it. Build up treasures in heaven instead of treasures on earth, right? So now we've got the second vision. And the NLT calls it four horns and four blacksmiths. I put a little notation in there. Reap if you don't repent. So my first one I called repent. The second one I'm going to call reap if you don't. Then I looked up and saw four animal horns. What are these, I asked. The angel who was talking with me replied, These horns represent the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four blacksmiths. What are these men coming to do, I asked. The, I asked. the angel replied, These four horns, these nations, scattered and humbled Judah, 
humbled. They should have anyway. Now these blacksmiths have come to terrify those nations and throw them down and destroy them. That one's fairly clear. We've, we've got the nations that destroyed Israel. God's going to restore, and now he's going to bring his wrath out on them, not because they did what he told them to do, but because they didn't repent and come to him during this. Instead, they just carried out their wrath and punishment, and now they're living in peace. Because the world's at peace because it's conquered. Okay, It's your second picture in the, in the vision there. <clears throat> Chapter 2 starts out with future prosperity of Jerusalem is what the NLT says. It's the third vision. When I looked again, I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. Where are you going, I asked. He replied, I am going to measure Jerusalem to see how wide and how long it is. Then the angel who was with me went to meet the second angel who was coming towards him. The other angel said, hurry and say to that young man, Zechariah, Jerusalem will someday be so full of people. When? Is this now? Especially if I am the recipient of this message then. Is this when this is going to be? Good, because I'm tired of suffering, right? It will be so full of people and livestock that there won't be room enough for everyone. Many will live outside the walls. Then I myself will be prote a protective wall or and fire, a fall of, wall of fire around Jerusalem, says the Lord, and will be, be the glory inside the city. Now, you know, if you keep reading and if you understand history, that didn't come to those people then. They were called to suffer still longer. For whatever reasons, it's God's plan. Who are we to say? And if you remember John's revelations, we still see the same thing. And he was said, said that this is the signs of things that will come. And we'll see them come even in the future. Because this, war, this world is not at peace with God. We have sinned and rebelled. And he is working working his masterpiece out. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Verse 10 doesn't get quoted a lot, and I believe it's the NIV that uses masterpiece. King James uses workmanship. But we are God's workmanship, or his masterpiece. I like that one better. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Remember that the words of the prophet that said to love mercy, that's what we're told to do. To love like Jesus loved and lay down our lives for one another. Then the NLT has the exiles are coming home. And I made a notation there, rebuild. The Lord says, come away, flee from Babylon in the north, for I have scattered you to the four winds. So you have been called to repent already. You're going to reap if you don't repent. But if you do repent, I'm going to rebuild you. See the pattern here that I'm going after? Come away, people of Zion, who, you who are exiled in Babylon. Now, see, they didn't even want to come away. It's kind of like Egypt again. We're fat and happy here. Why do we want to go away and go back there? Okay? After a period of glory, a period of rest, the rest that the patrolman reported in the video... The Lord of heaven's army sent me against the nations who plundered you. For he said, anyone who harms you, because I'm jealous for you, remember that, harms my most precious possession. Now, I don't know what your version says there, but the literal words are the pupil or the apple of your eye. Isn't that nice to think? You are the apple of God's eye. The thing that makes his eye twinkle because he's so excited. The thing that comes about, and I don't know how to explain it, when boy meets girl for the first time and their eyes twinkle. That's what Scripture's saying, that God thinks about you. That's how much He loves you. Verse 9, I will raise my fist to crush them, and their own slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. The Lord says, Shout and rejoice, O beautiful Jerusalem, for I am coming to live among you. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day. What day? When? <laughs> and they too will be my people. Oh, maybe that's when Jesus came and died. And then talking about that, maybe that's talking about when Jesus returns again. But in that day, I'm thinking it's going to come right now, and that's what I'm hoping and looking for, right? I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord of heaven's army sent me to you. 
The land of Judah will be the Lord's special possession in the Holy Land, and He will once again choose Jerusalem to be His own city. Be silent before the Lord, all humanity, for He is springing into action from His holy dwelling. That's your third picture in the, the uh, visions. Chapter 3, cleansing the high priest, the fourth vision. I wrote this in there. It's another R if you haven't seen the pattern. Remove, because we need to remove the stain that we had when we went out and sinned. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Then the angel showed me Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, this vision of Jesus to come, the priest, our high priest that needs to intercede with us, someone who is still from the priestly line that made it through the Babylonian captivity and is now being restored. The high priest standing before the, before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there also at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Yeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusation, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick, like a fire poker or a brand uh, that has been snatched from the fire. Now, we could debate on what that means all over the place. But the way I like to look at that is Jesus himself snatched me from the fire. The people here don't know that in this day, but I know this because of history, because of the word that Jesus Christ came to die and what my outcome would have been had I not put my faith and hope and trust in him. But this is talking more literally about Yeshua of that day, Joshua, however you want to say it, and also an image of the Yeshua, Jesus, that would come. His clothing, verse 3, was filthy, as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the other standing there, Take off his filthy clothes. And turning to Yeshua, he said, See how I have taken away your sins. And now I am giving you these fine new clothes. Then I said, They should also place a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in clothes while the angel of the Lord stood by. As I read this, I thought about Peter and didn't want to be washed by Jesus. He said, You're already clean. I thought about how Peter wrote later that we are priests. We are priests carrying the royal garment so that we can carry the message of salvation to the people. Verse 6, Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly to Yeshua and said, This is what the Lord of heaven and army says, If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple and its courtyards. I will let you walk among these others standing here. Listen to me, O Yeshua the high priest, and all the other priests. You are symbols of things to come. Because see, no man is perfect, but Jesus Christ was perfect. So his blood can be poured out on the atonement seat, and God's wrath can be avenged. And if you believe in him and you follow him, then you carry his robes of righteousness. It goes on to say next, it says, Soon I am going to bring my servant the branch. I had to think there about Jesus calling himself the vine and we're the branches, but he's talking about a person here who symbolizes a person who made it through the, the Babylonian captivity and exile and is a direct descendant of, of David. He is mentioned in Matthew and Luke's lineage. Okay? Zerubbabel, if I said that right. <laughs> So soon I'm going to bring my servant the branch. Now look at the jewel set before Yeshua, a single stone. And Jesus called himself a stone. He's a cornerstone, right? With seven fa faucets, which are eyes. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail of what that means, but we've got Ezekiel's eyes on the wheels again, seeing everything, okay? I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord of heaven army. I will remove sin the sins of this land in a single day. Jesus Christ removed them on a single day when he died for us. And he will redeem his own on a single day when he returns. Verse 10, And on that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit with you peacefully. You think you're experiencing peace now, but that day you will experience true peace. Under your own vine or grapevine and fig tree. Now you've got to read and study a little bit here to understand what these mean. And you will see them a lot more in Scripture. But you'll understand that they're a symbol of Israel. 
There are also a symbol, the, sh the fig tree was the one that gave uh, shade, right? Um, the fig tree is the one that gave the leaves to cover Adam and Eve in their nakedness and shame. So there's so much symbolism here. We could spend an eternity of time, but yeah, that's a sign of true peace that could come to, to the Israelites if they were sitting there with their own vine under their own tree. They understood this example. Vision 5, Zechariah chapter 4, and the NLT says it's a lampstand and two olive trees. And I have put up another R here, replace. Because once I've had my sin removed, I need to replace those desires with something else, don't I? A desire to love the Lord, a desire to be filled with His Spirit, a desire to be filled with His Word. And I've got to read His Word and study His Word to do that. To be an approved workman is our Awanas thing. To be an approved workman that handles, rightly handles the Word of God. Okay? Verse 1, Then the angel who had been talking with me returned and woke me up, woke me as though I had been sleeping. That implies that he wasn't. Oh, boy, that reminds me of Paul's words, doesn't it? Wake up, you sleeper. Ah, let's see. I don't have them here, but I think I have them here. Romans 3, And some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we have already shown that all, all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the Scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, no one is seeking God. All have turned away and all have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. And it starts with waking up. And then Ephesians 5 says, For the light makes everything visible. That's why it said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't be satisfied with the Babylon around you that has given you the comforts of this world. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You have been given new life. You have been empowered by the Spirit of God. So if you remove that sinful nature, you need to replace it with the Spirit of God. Verse 2 says, what do you see now? He asked, I answered, I see a solid gold lamp stand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with wicks. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, What are these, my Lord? What do they mean? Don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, This is what the Lord said to Zerubbabel, who, that descendant of David, who is now in the land, the king. We have the priest mentioned, and we have the king, of which Jesus came from both lineages. And then you have these words right here. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit. What you need to replace in your life. Says the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 7, nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. That's the words of the NLT. They literally mean grace, grace. Now you might figure out why I sang, had them sing that song this morning. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of my sins. That's what the people will shout. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of the temple and he will complete it. And that's what started at that time. That's what he did. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. Then I asked the angel, What are those two olive trees on each side of the lampstand? And what are the two olive branches that pour out golden oil through the two gold tubes? Don't you know, he asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, they represent the two anointed ones who stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. 
these two literal men, but these two literal men represent Jesus Christ, the one who can do it all. You've got the fifth vision in the picture. Then in Zechariah chapter 5, you have the sixth vision, a flying scroll. I'm going to label that one with this R, reinterpret. Now that you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, the Word of God will become new to you. It will become living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you need to go back again and again and again and read what God's Word is telling you. And you'll find out that you read some of these stories like I hope you find out in Esther, and you're like, wait a minute, I never saw that before because that's what I did when, when I was previewing that. Here's what it says in chapter 5. I looked up again and I saw a scroll flying through the air. What do you see? The angel asked. I see a flying scroll. I replied, it appears to be about 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. That just happens to be the same measurements of the temple porch of Solomon's temple where the law was read to the people. And of course, the scrolls represent the written law of God. Then he said to me, the scroll contains the curse. Merle read that this morning. Joshua reiterated Joshua when he took the people into the promised land and said, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose blessings or cursings, life or death. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One side of the scroll says that those who steal will be banished from the land. The other side says that those who swear falsely will be banished from the land. And as I read this, I thought about how Jesus expounded upon the law and says if you thought it in your heart, you're guilty of it. Verse 4, and this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says, I am sending this curse into the house of every thief and in the house of everyone who swears falsely using my name. And I thought, boy, what will that day be like when Jesus returns for those that have proclaimed His name by word only? What a dreadful day that will be. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my curse will remain on that house and completely destroy it, even its timbers and stones. You have the sixth vision in your picture. If you keep reading, you have the seventh vision, a woman in a basket. So I got another R for you, right? Relinquish. Because relinquish all of those sins that you've held on to. Because every Christian goes through this. They still have those desires in their heart. The only way you're not going to have those desires in your heart is to fill them with something else, to keep eating God's Word, to keep praying, to keep relying on Him so that you don't have those desires and fears anymore that God takes them completely away from you. Scripture says that it is His will that He sanctifies you through and through, and sanctification comes through His Word. Okay? The angel who was talking with me said, Look up. What do you see coming? What is it? I asked. He replied, it is a basket for measuring grain. The word is epha, which is the largest of the measuring devices used by them. It holds six gallons. It's not enough to hold a woman, so I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't have to understand it. I can understand what he's telling the people in that day by placing myself there. Um, and it was filled with the sins of everyone throughout the land. Okay, let me focus on that more. Then the heavy lead cover, and maybe yours says a talent. Uh-oh, a talent, it's just a round thing. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of talent, 30 talents of silver, wasn't he? He is the one that takes care of those sins. It takes them all away from us. But we betray him when we look to the things of the world. We're the ones that put the nails in his hands and feet. But the heavy lead cover was lifted off the basket, and there was a woman sitting inside. The angel said, The woman's name is Wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and closed the heavy lid. Then I looked up and saw two women flying towards us, gliding on the wind. They had wings like a stork, and they picked up the basket and flew into the sky. Where are they taking the basket, I asked the angel. He, said, he replied and said, To the land of Babylon, where they will build a temple for the basket, and when the temple is ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. i got no idea <laughs> here. Maybe the sins are just going to their foreign kingdom where they're going to be, but what I like to think with what the theme that I'm putting here is that if you let Jesus take these sins from you, they'll be as far as the east is from the west. God will remember them no more. He will remember that you're covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the seventh vision in your picture. 
Zechariah chapter 6. You didn't know you could read the Bible through this fast and try to understand it either, did you? Four chariots were division number eight. And I put that return home. Then I looked up again and saw four chariots coming from heaven between two bronze mountains. Mountains that are strong and huge. Bronze that is unmovable because the word of God is unmovable and his commands, his precepts, his judgments, and his rewards are immovable. They're huge. They're beyond anything we could think. The first chariot, now we've got horses and riders, but they're equipped with chariots. What are chariots used for? To co go into battle. We're coming to that day. The first chariot was pulled by red horses. Maybe blood, I don't know. The second by black horses. Death, I don't know. The third by white horses. Well, they've got some redemption there. And the fourth by powered, dappled, gray horse. Or maybe yours say grizzled and bay. It literally means spotted. It's random spottedness. So maybe they're going to bring good things to some and bad things to others. There are his messengers patrolling the earth. I don't know. Verse 4, And what are these, my Lord, I asked? The angel who was talking... Asked the angel who was talking with me. The angel replied, These are the four spirits of heaven who stand before the Lord of all the earth. And remember, we talked about patrolling earlier. They're going out to do his work. The chariot with the black horse is going north. Okay, going north to Babylon. He is bringing destruction. He is headed towards Babylon. The chariot with the white horses is going where, Steve? West. West is not in the scripture. The scripture says literally that he is going after. I don't know why West is there, and I've not found a good answer for why West is in there. So it says he's going after. Going after might mean I'm going the same direction, or I'm going out at the same time. I don't know what it is, but let's keep reading. <clears throat> and the chariot with dappled gray horses, the powerful one with the mixed purposes, is going south. There's no east. That's what Steve asked me. Why is there no east? Do we have to assume east? Well, there was no west in the scripture, so let's rule east and west out. And let's just talk about the known world at that time. If you would have said north and south, you'd have covered the entire world. These horses are going out with their chariots fit for battle to the whole world. No one escapes God's watchful eye. No one will escape punishment. Romans 1 says that no one is without excuse. Creation cries out that there is a God. You are a created being and you are responsible to Him as His creation. The powerful horse, horses, verse 7, were eager to set out on patrol. Why? Because judgment was coming, but so was restoration. And the Lord said, Go and patrol the earth. So they left at once on their patrol. Then the Lord summoned me and said, Look, those who went north have vented the anger of my spirit in the land of the north. You have the eighth picture in the vision. Then if you look at your picture, you have seven and eight is the conclusion. And I love how they put that because it says Zechariah turned around their question of is the kingdom of heaven here at hand now? And I'm thinking how Jesus' disciples were still asking him that on the day he ascended. Is now the time you're going to set up the, the kingdom of heaven? And his answer in Acts 1.8 is it's not for you to know the times or seasons. But I will give you power from on high, the Spirit who will give you new birth and new life so that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the other ends of the earth. And then the angels that were there then even said, Now quit standing around. <laughs> Go pray till you receive that and then get busy living the life that you proclaim. He turns a question around and reverses it says, Will you become the people who are ready to participate in God's kingdom. Wow, that's huge. Because when we reach Matthew, all you're going to hear about is the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist said it. Jesus started his ministry saying that. Because unless you repent, the very first thing in this process, you will not come to God. And you will lose out on salvation that day. The crowning of Yeshua is what's read next. It says, Then I received another message of the Lord, and it talks about the actual crowning, and I'm going to skip down to verse 15. 
People will come from distant lands to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And when this happens, you will know that my messages have been from the Lord of heaven's armies when that day comes. All this will happen if you carefully obey what the Lord your God says. They didn't obey, did they? We haven't obeyed, have we? And that's why we want to say grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sins. Grace that can pardon me and cleanse me. Then chapter 7 of the NLT says, A call to justice and mercy. Verse 5 says, Say to your people and your priests, During these 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and early autumn, was it really for me that you were fasting? Even now in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking just to please yourself? Verse 7, isn't this the same message you've heard over and over and over again? When are you going to listen? When are your eyes going to be open? Because there comes a point when God can close them for you. Now that can be salvation. I don't know how it can be in a Christian's life. What I pray for is that you do hear the Spirit of God calling you to repent to come to Him so you can do all those things that I mentioned. Yeah, I'll say them again so you know what they are. <laughs> I label the first vision as repent. The second one, if you don't repent, you're going to reap. But if you do repent, the third one is you're going to rebuild. The fourth one is your sins are going to be removed. fifth one is I'm going to replace them with my spirit. The Sixth one is now you can reinterpret and redefine who you are through the Word, that you can be sanctified through and through. Seventh one, that you can relinquish all of your sins, not have to worry about them anymore. They'll be carried away. And then number eight, that you can return home to God for all eternity. Now I tried to go through that fast and try to show you what we do in Corinthians. Hopefully you'll come. But that's what those visions said to me. And that's teaching through God's Word. As you read it, you'll see more things. And then if you're in Bible study, you can point them out to me. But these visions don't have to be something that, that you say you can't figure out. And you have to figure out what day this is and what that day is. Because Jesus already said it's not for you to know those times or seasons. But you are to be my hands and feet. You are to be a light to this world. Paul said that you have an obligation and that you are ambassadors of Christ living in a foreign land. Jesus is our high priest. He is our king. He came to die for our sins once and for all. And he will come again to claim his own. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it stood the test of time. We thank you that you tell us over and over again so that we can get it. Open our minds and our hearts to turn ourselves to the one who turned himself and gave his life for us, to Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your wonderful mercies, for your grace upon grace upon grace. And we pray, Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege of carrying this gospel message. And we pray as the first, ch first church did to give us boldness to preach your word, especially in a time where we're not faced with so much suffering. We're placed... We're faced with complacency and, and luxuries of life to, to distract us. Lord, take Satan away. Let him not have any holds because Jesus Christ defeated him totally on the cross and made us right with you if we put our faith and trust and hope in him. Bless this day. Bless your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.